Welcome to Marketing Speak, a series of interviews and monologues featuring thought leaders and industry practitioners in search engine optimization, e-commerce, and online marketing. Here's your host, Stefan Spencer, SEO expert, author, speaker, consultant, and internet entrepreneur. I love it when a guest is willing to bear all to share what they do behind the scenes, even when they're skirting the Google guidelines, which of course is not something I would suggest you do, but it is very enlightening to hear what is happening behind the scenes, especially when you're trying to scale something as difficult as link building. And our guest today in this episode number 154 is Julie Joyce. She's the owner of the link building agency, Linkfish Media. In addition, Julie has written a monthly column on link building for Search Engine Land for the last 10 years, and it's an excellent column. Julie, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you. I'm very excited. Yeah. So let's start by talking about link development and what do you think is the hardest part about getting links in this day and age? This is pretty close to my heart right now because I've been trying to train another group of link builders for a client. And the hardest thing that we're all facing, and that includes my agency, is just finding good sites. So, you know, we don't want to step all over a site that we've maybe worked with before or it's like covered up with links. But in some industries, like finance is a good example right now, I feel like every site we're running into that's worth anything is a site we've already worked with. So it's just getting more and more difficult just to find those good sites. And it's difficult to get a response to. But right now, I think my biggest problem is that so many sites just seem to exist for the purpose of selling ads or selling links. And a lot of them are just completely covered up. And I wouldn't think if I were looking at it, would I click on this link? That has gotten a lot harder for us. And that's the big thing we try to do for our clients to get a link that somebody would actually click on, even though, of course, we know they don't have to click on it for it to help with rankings. But it's just really finding those good sites that were very plentiful, say, 10 years ago. You could find tons of sites. And we used to contact some people that had no idea what we were even asking or talking about. They didn't know how to insert a link. But now it's anybody you contact, like the first thing out of their mouth is how much money. Yeah, (laughs) right. And what do you say in response to that? Do you actually pay them or do you just have a hard line about no, never? Well, we do because we got kind of a reputation years ago for buying links as safely as possible, I guess is what I could say, for really competitive industries. Like at the time we worked with gambling. So a lot of what we do does involve paid links. So, you know, it's not that big of a deal to us, I guess, because we know what we're doing. The clients know exactly what we're doing and they've signed off on it. But I'd say for us, the difficulty is they want a lot of money. And a lot of webmasters will come back and they will say, you know, of course, every page you pick where you want to link is obviously their most important page that gets a billion hits a day. So they come back with, well, I'll do this for $5,000 a month or 10000 for a permanent link. So the costs right now are just absolutely outrageous, too. Wow. for a permanent link. It's preposterous. Wow. So what's reasonable in your estimation for a link? A couple hundred dollars, $500, a monthly fee or what? Well, we do a lot. And sometimes this is at the client's request. They want us to get links on a yearly basis. So they don't, a lot of them don't want permanent links. So my maximum, like personally, is usually $150 because I have a database full of sites that's proof that we can do that. And I don't like to go above that. But if it was a really, really good site that looked very authoritative and would send you some great traffic, we generally would go a little bit more. I think a few years back, we had a client that authorized up to $500 per link. And it ended up, I mean, I don't feel like we got better sites, to be honest. I think we just gave the webmasters more money than we probably could have talked them down to. Yeah. And how do you judge whether it's worth $50, $150, or maybe even a few hundred dollars? Is it DR, UR, trust flow, citation flow, traffic values? Like, What do you use as the gauge to determine how effective and valuable that link is going to be? Well, my opinion would probably differ from my clients. So when we started trying to figure out what metrics to use, Almost all of them at the time wanted to use Moz. So, you know, a lot of them go by the domain authority and we built that into our internal system. So that's what we've kind of stuck to. And if a site had a really high DA, that wouldn't automatically say to me, you know, we should pay more for this. A lot of it, in all honesty, it depends on how well my link builders can negotiate. 
So, you know, we might get some sites sometimes that we get very lucky. They have no idea really what links are, and they might give us a link for $25. But then we have some that kind of just seem to exist to sell links. And we try to stay away from those, but there are times when a link builder on my team has approached those guys and they say, they want this amount of money. They show me the site. And I'm like, well, you just need to stay away. So lots of times it really depends on the link builders negotiating skills and how much time you're willing to spend to try to get a good price. Mm -hmm. And would you say that the vast majority of the links that you build on behalf of your clients are paid for? They are. Yeah, they are definitely. And we kind of got good at that. And so I'm of the opinion that people are going to buy links and we seem to be able to do it pretty well and not have clients that are constantly getting in trouble for it because we try to be you know, we try to get links that look like they would actually be real links. It's just that the webmaster wants money for their time to update the content or something like that. So. Yeah. And what kinds of links are you getting? Are these like link insertions? Are they guest posts? Are they reviews of products or services that your clients are offering? What do these links look like? They are usually link insertions, although we do have some new content that we'll place for clients, but we don't tend to do guest posts. One reason is just because, you know, a lot of other companies do that and that's kind of their thing. They're really good at it. So what we try to do is find some content that looks like it can be updated. So we might find an article from 2016 and it has a list of resources and they talk about all these different things and our client has something updated. So we might approach them and just say, you know, we've got some new information, here it is, and kind of go from there. So a lot of it's just trying to make an older post more relevant to the current situation with everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I'm thinking a client's perspective, I have on one hand an agency that's saying, okay, we're pearly white hat, we are doing link earning and link baiting, We're, we're not doing guest posting, we're not paying for the links. We're not doing link insertions. We're just squeaky clean, the kind of links that Google engineers would be happy that we're building. So don't go to any of these other companies, these other agencies that will do the guest posting type uh, links, that will do the link insertions and, and the other stuff, because that's gray hat at best. It's only a matter of time before Google will pull the rug out from under you. If those are the kinds of links that you're building, what would you tell somebody who is like, let's say you catch wind of of that kind of discussion or you're part of that conversation? What do you tell people in response to that? I don't truly think that you can just say you're white hat and you're going to be out of trouble forever. Because I've seen a lot of people that I've done link audits for and they have never even intentionally built links. I had an example of a guy who had a quotes website and He had been penalized. It's like his site just dropped out of everything. And a lot of it, when I looked at it, looked like he had a lot of people in forums that were using different quotes in their signatures in the forum. And it linked back to him, which, you know, I thought was pretty natural. But apparently Google didn't. So I've seen so many people that have been penalized by things where I don't think they really did anything that would be considered gray hat or black hat. So I would also say I don't like it when other people kind of down what someone else does. And they say, don't go with these guys because it's not safe or it's not that. Because I just don't like it to talk bad about what another person is doing with SEO, unless it's truly very, very dangerous. And a lot of times, I hate to say this, but we have had a fair amount of SEOs and SEO companies contact us to try to get us to buy links for their clients. And I'm pretty sure they don't want to tell the clients. Because I've worked with someone who said, when you send me the report, just don't include the costs on there. Because we don't really want to, you know, open up that can of worms. And at that point, we stopped because I don't think that's a very good idea. And if someone was doing something risky for my side, I'd really want to know about it. I don't think anybody is as white hat as they like to think. Maybe some are, but I don't know. Some people would say asking for links in any kind of way is not a great idea. And if you have a ton of money, I think it's perfectly reasonable that you could create really good content that could just generate fantastic links. But not every client has $20,000 for a massive content budget. Yeah, 100% agree with you that it's important to be transparent with the client, the end client. If you're working through kind of a contract or subcontractor arrangement, the end client needs to know that links have been paid for. Right, exactly. If that's happening, yeah. Yes. So let's uh, talk about the metrics for success. So we talked a little bit about how DA 
from Moz, Domain Authority, is a metric that a lot of link sellers will rely on because, it, frankly, it's much easier to game that metric than some of the other metrics. Right. What are some of the you know, metrics and measurements for success in your view? In my view, I think you would look at so many different things. I would look at, you know, is it, what we are doing, does it increase your traffic? Are your rankings going up? And is that increasing traffic? Percentage of new visitors, things like that. And I don't really look at things the same way a lot of the clients do, though, because initially I started out thinking, you know, I came from just a pure SEO background and I wanted to look at all these different metrics. And it seems like every client we would get had a different tool they used for metrics. And that's still true. So I kind of got to the point, it's not scientific at all, but with us, we figure if a client stays with us, then they're happy and everything must be going well. Mm -hmm. Some of them, they measure success differently too. Some people want to move up in the rankings. Some of them in very competitive industries just basically want to keep their spots. They don't want to fall behind and they know that there are, you know, all the other companies are doing this. So they just want to keep up. So a lot of them are just kind of happy if they seem to be doing as well as they were six months ago, even if they're not technically improving. Yeah. What would be some of your favorite tools for link analysis? Well, let's start with link analysis, and then we'll talk about things like outreach after that. Okay. For link analysis, I tend to use Majestic or SEMrush. I kind of go between the two, but I've been using Kerbu for ages. So that's a, a tool that can help you identify you know, your most dangerous links potentially. So I tend to grab as much data as I can, you know, Webmaster Tools also. Basically, any link tool I have that can give me links, I just kind of throw it into Kerbu. And it sorts things out so it has all these different bands of your risk. So something, you know, will show you that this is like really risky or this is probably neutral. And I just kind of sort things out and go that way. But I still, if anything looks dangerous, I still visit it just to make sure. So I'd say that is definitely my main tool. Okay. Um, so Kerbu, I like it. And, yeah, it's and, very good. Kerbu. And what about Majestic? What is it about Majestic that you really like? For me, for example, I love TrustFlow. I love having the separate metric for trust from uh, differentiated from importance. Whereas with, let's say, Ahrefs, you only have DR, domain rating, which doesn't tell you how much trust is baked into that and how much importance is baked in. Baked in. So I want to be able to distinguish those two concepts. What is it for you that you love about Majestic? One thing I think I love Majestic is that I'm just familiar with it because I've always used it and I've used it for so many years. They, they seem to have just a lot of great features and some of them, I read the definitions of what the metric is. And I'm still confused by it, but I like it. I really like the topical trust flow. I like the way it, you can look at a profile and see how many links are coming in that seem to be finance sites or pet sites or something like that. So that is actually, currently, I'd say that's the most useful feature for me. Yeah. Yeah. I love that too. And mm -hmm. I love just looking at the topics and how it, what the distribution looks like. It, right. Does it it's look unnatural? I think right. it's a, it gives you, well, right. Exactly. Like if you have a finance site you're building links for, and the number one topical trust flow is something like pet, that looks kind of strange. Yeah. So I think it, it does give you a really good idea, a quick overview kind of of the link profile. Yeah. And then with uh, Kerbu, you say that y you pull in these link data sources from Majestic and uh, SEMrush and so forth and feed all that into Kerbu, and then it does its analysis from that. Like, Could you describe a bit more, uh, you know, just go a little bit into more detail on Kerbu? I sure. personally have never used Kerbu. I use a lot of link analysis tools, link research tools, for example, and Ahrefs, and, you know, just a bunch of Link Explorer, et cetera. I'm not that familiar with Kerbu. Okay, it does. You know, it's very similar to link research tools in that it's very useful to see if you can, like if you have a huge link profile, to give you an idea of where to start looking to see if you have bad links. That's what I really like about it. It's very simple. It will tell you, I don't know what their score is, that starts, you know, kind of you're in a dangerous territory here, but you might get a link score of something like 691 or 800. I think something above 600 tends to be, you know, you really need to look at this and see what's going on. And most sites that I analyze are in the 600 range. So when I do that, it kind of some bad stuff, but everybody's doing well. The, that tool is just, that's the main thing I use it for. And a lot of that, you know, I will be honest here, the creators of it are friends of mine. 
and got to test it out in the early stages. And I just really liked it. So I think a lot of my loyalty to it is not just that it's a great tool, in my opinion, but it's a tool that my friends created that I do want to use. Yeah, that's cool. Have you ever tried Link Detox from Link Research Tools? I have. I used that for years, too. And I didn't have any problems with it at all. Like I said, I mean, really, the only reason I switched is because my tool budget kind of got out of control because I kept buying things. And this was one that at the time they were letting me use for free because we were friends. So that's why I kind of switched to that. But I loved link research tools. I had no problem with that whatsoever. And I had used it for years. Yep. Yeah. So it's a great tool set. Yes. I'm very uh, affectionate to <laughs> link research tools. They're, they're friends of mine. Christoph has been on this uh, show a couple of times, actually. We have a part one and part okay. two, which I'll include a link to both of those episodes in the show notes, uh, listeners. So check those uh, two episodes out. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of Link Research Tools. I've got a couple dozen different tools inside of there, Link Detox being one of them. It sounds like there's a lot of similarity there with Link Detox and Kerbu right. in terms of getting uh, like a toxicity score for your link profile. Is there anything else yes. about Kerbu that is different from link detox or a link detoxification kind of tool? I don't know that I've noticed if there is because I probably I don't know what else link research tools has anymore. Just because it's probably been three years since I used them. But at the time, you know, I thought they were pretty similar. I think link research tools had a lot more functionality for different things, whereas Kerbu kind of at the time was made to just really help you hone in on the bad links and do something about those. Yeah. And so when you do something about it, that's creating a disavow file, that's maybe doing outreach to the website owners of the toxic sites and getting them to remove the link. Like, What's your process for cleaning things up if the toxicity level is too high? Usually it's just been going straight to the disavow, which is probably not the best idea. But we had one campaign where we tried to do link cleanup. And I think out of a thousand sites we emailed, we might have gotten two links removed. People just didn't even bother to respond. So we just usually kind of, if they really need it, go straight to the disavow. Yeah. Yeah. That's one thing that I find to be the case too. And we do campaigns for outreach, link removal outreach for our clients when they have a toxic link profile is the response rate is really low and you have to get very aggressive right. and you have to do a, multiple follow-ups. So figure it that you got to follow up at least three times. And right. we use Pitchbox to do that where it ties in very nicely with Link Detox. So there's very tight oh. integration. For, it's very cool. So the disavow file is created by Link Detox and then it talks to Pitchbox via APIs so that it does the creation of that prospect list of sites to outreach to over on the link detox side. And then Pitchbox executes on that, sends out the campaigns, you write the email templates and everything and the, set the follow-up criteria, how many days until follow-up message is sent and can forward the original email. And yeah, you get, just get more aggressive the <laughs> longer right. it goes where they're not responding. And like, oh, I don't really want to report you to Google, but I will <laughs> if I don't hear back right. from you. Yeah. Exactly. So we get single digit percentages of responses, but I think it's enough that right. Google says, okay, so you put in the hard yards. And uh, so we're going to let you out, right. out of the penalty box. Yeah. That's always good. <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious, do you use Pitchbox for outreach? No, I don't. And I know you had asked about outreach tools. I actually don't use any outreach tools and neither does my team. And some of that just came about, I mean, I feel like we're complete Luddites in this industry because we don't do it. But I think the danger and the risk of paid links when we first started, that made me nervous. So I, I just always wanted to make sure we didn't make mistakes like sending an email that said, hey, F name or something like that. Like I get all the time. There are all kinds of errors in these automated emails. So we do everything by hand, which is very tedious. But that's just how we've done it. And I've tried using I think I tried BuzzStream before and, and I loved it. I thought it was actually really cool. But one of my best link builders is an older man who didn't have a lot of computer experience when he came to us. And, you know, I tried to use it with him and he just didn't like it. He didn't take to it at all. He likes to do things his way. And I figure we've been doing it this way for over 10 years and it works. So 
I just haven't really looked into those that much, but I should. I think they could be very valuable, definitely. It saved me a lot of time if I could just make the time to look at them. <laughs> That's all I need to do. Yeah, yeah. It is something that I think will scale and streamline some processes for you. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm particularly fond of Pitchbox, <laughs> and they're friends of mine as well. I've not used BuzzStream, but actually I've heard anecdotally a number of people who have used both rave about Pitchbox and don't have as nice things to say about BuzzStream. So I'm probably not even going to try BuzzStream. Yeah. And another thing, too, that I think you'll like about Pitchbox is that you can can have a moderation queue. I forget what they call it, but it's a holding box where it's completely optional. But if you turn that on, you can have somebody like a QA person go through the emails, make sure that they look all hunky-dory before they get sent out. So you'll never okay. have an F name or like a some weird mail merge thing sneak in there if you turn on that feature. Okay. Well, that is interesting because a lot of my reluctance also is I like to see everything that's going out and I like to look at it. So if my guys close a link, when they're submitting it all to me, I see the whole email thread. And I do tend to keep an eye on that just to make sure I think their outreach is as it should be. So it would be good to be able to look at something before it goes out. I'm just nervous, I think. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's important to make sure that the I's are dotted, the T's are crossed. I'm very particular right. about this sort of stuff. I'm a stickler. <laughs> and if somebody right, sends exactly. me a link request or any kind of outreach where they want something, my spidey sense is already <laughs> uh, up right? because they want something. They're not giving. They're trying to get something. I'm looking for things that seem disingenuous or like mail mergey type stuff, things like, uh, right. exactly. I loved your last bl blog post, and then it inserts the name of the blog post in there. And I'm like, you got to be kidding right. me. You've never been to my blog. <laughs> <laughs> right. I hate that stuff. I hate it. So I know, I do too. You can achieve the personal touch and make it feel like you've been to their blog, you've been to their podcast or whatever it is that you're pitching and right. mail merge things in there that uh, I think they call it backfilling over a pitch box where you get somebody, let's say overseas person at uh, a few dollars an hour going in and building this data repository of things like something insightful to say about a recent post and or a recent podcast episode and stuff beyond just the basic thing of I found your last article insert in the blank to be really insightful right to actually have something right. insightful to say about their insights and you can hire somebody right, to good. go in and backfill all that and that is what gets mail merged in and not just first name and latest blog post and name of blog. Yeah, pretty cool. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah. Very cool. So let's talk about other types of tools. We talked about link analysis tools. We talked about outreach tools. What are some of the tools that you use that help you to be more productive and to systematize and scale your business, like any agency, whether it's a link development agency or it's an ad agency or a print media agency, they're always looking to scale and not just by adding more staff, by adding smarter systems and processes, standard operating procedures and so forth. Like, What are some tools that have rocked your world in that area? Well, first of all, I think it's everybody's goal to scale things. And I like what you said about making processes more efficient because I am interested in that. We don't plan to grow any bigger, though, because we're very small now. And when we started out, we got to about 50 people and it was completely unmanageable for me. So I had to have a mid-level manager who saw everything and then I just kind of managed everything else. And I hated that because I never could see exactly what we were doing. And I was the one who reported to the client. So if they had questions, I couldn't say, well, I approved this or I knew what was going on. So I don't have any desire to scale in that way. And because of that, we can't really scale in terms of getting more clients. But we do need to get more efficient. And my main tool that I use for business and personal use is Evernote, which I think is I've been with them for ages. And it just you can create notebooks, you can create notes. So I have you know, a notebook for each client, I've got notes, so I have all of my emails in there, correspondence with clients or 
their latest requests and things like that. And it's searchable. So if I'm trying to find all the notes related to a client, you know, I just click a keyword and, and it pops up everything. So that helps me stay organized. I have a file for different things for, you know, travel, for example, and just, you know, receipts and things like that that I put in there. So that has become kind of the only tool that I use to stay organized in any way, because everything I need is right there. And you can get it on your phone, on the laptop, and it syncs up. I tried some project management tools out, and I just never could really get into them. But we do have an internet at work that a former IT guy built for us. So that's our main way to stay organized with work. And it has a queue and it assigns different clients to different link builders. But I still use Evernote and I've tried to get my team to use it. And they're even worse than me. They don't really want to learn anything new with regards to any kind of software. (laughs) So I feel bad. I'm just like, I don't even try sometimes, but I like Evernote. I'm just, I think if anybody has any kind of system that works for them, I like that. Yeah. You know, I tried to get another client to use Evernote and they said, well, we like Google Docs. And I said, that's great. Then, you know, just let me see that. And that's how they organize everything. And I've had a few clients that use that. Some of them put everything in a project management tool. I just really like Evernote because I do work from home and I own the company and I have a crazy schedule. And it's like the main thing where I can see everything that's going on in my life, personal and business. So that's been my go to for years. I love that. I'm a big fan of Evernote as well. And ironically, I'm just about to record an interview with Charles Bird for my other podcast, which is The Optimized Geek. Oh, wow. And that's all about Evernote. He's an Evernote expert. Oh, I look forward to that. That's oh, you're awesome. going to love it. You're going to love it. He has. I'm going to love that, definitely. He has like 20,000 notes. Every single call he does, oh, every goodness. meeting, every right. everything gets created in Evernote and, and receipts. Everything goes in there. He uses tags. He's a ninja at tags and having a oh, tag wow. hierarchy. Yeah, it's really genius. In fact, he created a whole online course about using Evernote. It's like three or four hours. I've been going through it myself. I'm about uh, two-thirds of the way through it. Yeah, it's really, really good. So I think you're going to be excited to listen to that episode. I'll include a link in the show notes to that as well, but it's just it's going to be probably another month before that episode airs over on the Optimize Geek. I have a bunch of other productivity episodes there. If you're into productivity and organization and stuff, I've had David Allen on, the author of Getting Things Done. It's an incredible episode. I'm a oh, big cool. fan of GTD, by the way, uh, which is Getting Things Done. Right. I've had Tim Ferriss on talking about outsourcing, and I've had Mike Vardy, The Productivityist. That's a great podcast, by the way, The Productivityist. I've had Steve Robbins, another productivity guru, and Ari Mizell, like huge guru at outsourcing and productivity. Yeah, it's a, I'm a geek when it comes to productivity, and you're just yeah, I, we're singing the same from way. the same hymnal, I think, in terms of uh, <laughs> Evernote and that. Yeah, yeah. So what's oh, good. your good to what, find another Evernote geek? Yeah. So what's your favorite aspect of feature or capability of Evernote that you use all the time? That's been transformative for you? I just like to be able to search something on my phone, especially because when you have your own business, you're never really off. And it's nice to be somewhere and a client needs something and I can just quickly on my phone pop up whatever I need that's the note and send them an email. And it works that way too with my personal life. You know, I've been in situations like say at the bank trying to do something and they say, your son's social security number. And I just go and, you know, pull it up because I can't remember things like that. So I really like the ability. I like searching on my laptop, too, just to find something quickly. But being able to be somewhere else and just pop open your phone and find the information you need is incredible to me. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And one of my favorite features is when you scan receipts, business cards, uh, anything. Well, OCR that for premium users, if you have Evernote Premium, it will uh, optical character recognition turn that into text and that's all searchable content, which is amazing. That is amazing. And I do that too with receipts. And if we make payments, sometimes the systems you make payments to will send you the information you need in an image. And I've had that issue with PayPal sometimes. So if I'm searching my email, sometimes I might not see exactly what I need, but when I have it in Evernote like that, like you say, it converts it into text that's searchable. It's incredible. Yep. Yeah, cool. All right. So let's, let's, I think we covered enough tools here, unless there's something else that I've uh, left out or some 
area of, of focus I've left out that uh, you want to mention, we can add another tool in here. Uh, otherwise, let's move on to another topic. Are we good on tools? Okay, that's fine. We're good. Okay, cool. So let's talk about what sort of outreach emails uh, get deleted automatically, get you into, you know, submitted to the spam house and that sort of thing, and which ones get you the desired result of getting a link? Like, What's the magic in getting the good result? What are the landmines that will get you into trouble? We used to have a lot more problems getting spam issues when we were bigger, I guess, and we were all sending emails from the same domain. So one thing we don't do usually is mention a URL in the initial email because we found that lots of times that did get deleted. But I have spoken to people that that seems to work for them. So with us, I think it's just a different thing because we are offering money. And it's ridiculous that it wouldn't happen. But of course, if you're going to offer somebody money and they want money, they're going to respond to your email. Pretty simple with us. We don't really have anything I have found People just will say no, because we, of course, say if you aren't interested in hearing from us again, then please let us know. We'll add you to our list of people not to contact. So before my guys send any email, they look at the Internet and they can tell if this person has already been contacted and said, leave me alone. So we don't tend to get people who are just like, I'm going to report you because you keep bothering me. Even when we follow up, I think they just delete the emails. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So let's say that you have amazing template that you've written that's going to get you a lot of results in terms of people saying, yes, you've included something in there about you're willing to pay. Do you use that same template across a lot of different clients, a lot of different sites, or do you change it up a lot so that you're not leaving a footprint for Gmail to put you in the junk folders? Right. Well, we do change it up for each client generally because we would try to make it, you know, we have a very basic template, but we try to make it more applicable to each industry. And That's another good thing to talk about is we do have one guy who uses Gmail for outreach and he's the only one that does it. But he has an alias account with us. That's like a different old domain that we used to use for emailing. So he and another guy use that. And we looked one time to see if the Gmail conversion rate was any different from that other domain. And it was about the same. So I've said before, it'd be great to figure out which one is better for you and you use that. But it's like almost 50 50 every time we look at it. It's very strange. So what you're saying is that you are sending or that guy was sending emails from a Gmail address and getting similar deliverability versus sending it from the client's domain name? Well, it's not. We don't use the client's domain names for these emails just because of the risk. So a long time ago, we just had a few domains that we bought that we use for email accounts from that domain. Got it. Okay. Have you gotten requests from clients saying, well, I'd like you to send your outreach emails from our domain name and we'll set you up with an email address? No, we haven't because of the payment, I think. I wouldn't do that with a client's email. When we did do some guest post placement and we were not paying, we did have that. And it didn't last long enough, really, that I could tell you if it would have been better off coming from Gmail or something. It came from the client's email. It just wasn't successful because the client honestly just didn't have great content, in my opinion. They, you know, they were not somebody I probably, in hindsight, would should not have taken them on. Hmm. Got it. Have you heard of a tool called EmailWise? No, I haven't. Okay, this is a tool worth checking out. It was created by Jeremy Shoemaker, aka Shoe Money, who's also been a guest on this show. I'll include a link in the show notes to his episode. So email-wise is all about testing the email deliverability before you send out your campaign. And it has a whole bunch of Gmail accounts, Yahoo mail accounts, and Hotmail, etc. And it will check all of those inboxes to see, and the junk folders to see where your email ended up. Before, oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, it's amazing. So it will make sure that you've got a highly deliverable email before you send it out. So okay, that, I'll definitely have to check that out. And get this, it's actually free. <laughs> He's decided not to charge nice. money for the tool. So it's, yeah, the price is right well, for that's sure. That's even better. Yeah, so definitely. I'll, I'll include a link in the show notes to that too. All right, okay. so why don't we talk about how to get a company that doesn't want to pay for links to the top of the search results through link earning strategies? Because, you know, you've been writing for 
for search engine land for many, many years, like 10 years or something, right? And uh, I'm sure you cover in a number of the articles, link earning strategies, content marketing, creating link bait, or what's the term du jour that people use in the SEO industry? Uh, Linkable assets. That's what it, it changes is. so often. Yes, linkable assets. The linkable yes. assets. I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> whatever you want to call it, it's still the same thing. It's stuff that's right. remarkable, that's worth remarking about, to use Seth Godin's definition of remarkable. So, right. What's the, in your opinion, the secret sauce to getting these linkable assets or the link worthy content in, instead of the garbage stuff that you would get from a, you know, like you mentioned, the clients who had come up with the craziest, worst content you could imagine. We have had the most success with anybody that has like a resource, like a how-to guide. And a lot of the work that we have done where we weren't paying and we were asking for links, I did a lot of that myself just because the other guys didn't have as much experience. And the most success we did have was you know, we had stuff like how to grow cilantro, you know, pretty basic, but the way it was presented was really cool, had all kinds of things broken down about recipes you could have cilantro in and different types of cilantro. And that was very successful just because it was a huge piece on something, just a tiny little herb there. But they went into all kinds of crazy stuff. So I guess if you were one of those people that's a cilantro fanatic, you would like it. And that was very successful. Another thing that we've had a lot of success with would be something that included a video, like a how-to video, whether it's repairing your dishwasher or replacing some part in your refrigerator. That seemed to go very well, too. So I think if it's something that is truly useful, not just that the client thinks it's useful or you might think so, but people actually are searching for something like this that could save them a ton of money. That always seemed to go well for us. We had one campaign where I think we got, it was like an 80% conversion rate for our outreach. And it was for one of those how to grow a specific, I don't remember if it was a vegetable or if it was an herb, but that's what it was. It's like everybody loved it. And just because it was so detailed and so much information about like a, a tomato, for example, you don't think you can write that much about a tomato, but these people did. <laughs> well, one thing I bet our listeners don't know about tomatoes is that they're fruit. <laughs> they're not vegetables, Ooh, they're fruits. That's very true. That's very true. So you said 80% conversion rate. Is that 80% of the emails that you sent out were converted into links where they actually said yes? Yes. yes. Holy cow. Yes, they did. And that is so rare for us. I will never get over that, I think, because we've never come anywhere close to that. We may occasionally have 50 to 60%. Recently, we've been buying for a client that Basically, I would think any site on the planet would link to these guys because they just cover everything. It's a great site. And we've had really high conversion rate with them. Like very few people say no that actually respond to us. And we've had some very low ones, like 2 3% sometimes with clients. Oh, wow. Which is not fun. Yeah. I got to ask you about this how to grow cilantro piece. <laughs> I personally hate cilantro and I found out why I hate cilantro. For me, it tastes like it genetic. Soap. Yes, it's <laughs> <Right>. genetic. <laughs> That's so crazy. I know. I, I was doing my. I got my DNA run by Twenty Three and Me. Yeah, me and, too. You know, with, oh my gosh! And I saw that, and it said that I was the same way. But I don't mind it that much. But a lot of it makes me kind of sick. Yeah, but it's fascinating that it it tastes like soap to some people. It does. That's crazy. I do not like it. <laughs> it's oh, it's awful. So did you include that in the article? <laughs> no, that was after the fact, sadly. Uh, okay. And that wasn't mentioned. That would be great because so many people don't know that. You just know. I mean, I think every one of my friends, I could tell you if they love or hate cilantro because people have a very violent reaction if they don't like it. They get very angry and upset about cilantro. Yeah. Like, don't put that in my food. I just Don't put it anywhere near me. <laughs> yeah. It will ruin the dish. It will right. just, I won't want it. Right. Yeah. I'm curious now if let's say that you're talking to a prospect and they want to know what kind of budget to allocate to your agency fees, what kind of budget to allocate to the you know buying these links. Right. What, what do you tell them in terms of kind of setting the expectations? Well, we charge per link that we actually secure. And I've been criticized for that before because I understand it makes you want to get more links so you can charge more money. But with most clients, what they do is they give me a, or I'll give them a maximum. They might say, you know, we don't want to exceed $3,000. And it tends to be about $350 per link with us. 
because as I mentioned, I don't like to pay more than 150 and then the $200 is for our labor because it can take so long to just get one link. If that makes sense. Yeah, we analyze that every year or so just to see how many hours it takes and make sure we make a small profit. So are we talking maybe the typical client would spend $5,000 a month on, on link building with you? That's probably typical. We have a few big clients that have, they have very big budgets. And then we have some that we might do one or two links a month for them. And some come and go, they might want three links here. And then six months down the road, they want five. So we have clients kind of floating in and out of this all the time. But I generally try to see what they want to spend and make it fit that. I don't like to talk people into a huge budget, especially because if you get a person, a site who has very few links and then they come to me and they say, I want to get 50 links this month, that is extremely dangerous to me. And it's going to be very obvious that something weird is going on. So generally, I guess because we've been very busy because we're very, very lucky to have a lot of great clients and referrals coming in. So most of what I do now is try to talk people down or talk them out (laughs) altogether. I don't know that one link a month is going to help you, but some just, that's what they want. And I take them on lots of times because it gives my guys something different to do. So, you know, they might be working to try to get 30 links for a big client in a month, and then they can just spend an hour trying to do something for this guy here and there. And so they like that. But usually it's, we do charge per link, as I say. So if they had a $3,000 budget, that might be eight, nine links, something like that. But we tend to get a maximum from everybody. So we know what not to go over. Gotcha. So I'm curious, do you talk about this on your column at Search Engine Land? Do you talk about buying links, essentially going against Google's guidelines because they say don't buy links? Right. Do you talk about that on your Search Engine Land column or? No. Okay. (laughs) Gotcha. I wrote an article years and years ago about paid links and it got a lot of negative attention, I think. So I don't, but I think the same principles of a lot of what we do apply to anything. And occasionally I do take on consulting jobs or I might do, you know, some strictly white hat work for somebody. So that tends to be what I try to write about and things just about general outreach, because I think the same thing, if no matter what you're doing, they're just basic principles. You don't want to have spelling errors. You want to try to be personal, but not too long. Things like that can apply to everything. But obviously a publication like Search Engine Land isn't going to want to have somebody on their website saying buy link. And I don't generally advocate that people buy link. I just happen to do it. I think one time I gave the analogy, which is kind of terrible, but about like providing users with clean needles because you know people are going to buy links. So we just try to do it in the safest way possible and do it the best. I don't ever try to talk anybody into buying links. That's like generally, as soon as they contact me, that's the first thing I say. And most of what we do involves paid links. You probably don't want to do this. Here are the risks. And a lot of people just are willing to risk it. So that's why we continue to do it. But as I say, I wouldn't do it probably for my own side. Well, in fact, I definitely would and I never have. But I do think it's dangerous. But then I look at the success of our clients over the years. And when Penguin hit, it didn't impact any of our clients, which is remarkable considering the work we were doing. And we have had clients. I think we've had two people that I know of that had penalties and they were both working with about three or four different link companies at the time and just buying everything they could. So it could have been us definitely. But as much as I would say it's it's very risky and not the best idea, I also see that everybody we work with tends to do well. Yeah. So do you find that your clients are also working with other link building agencies that are doing other types of link building, such as the guest posting and that, or is it pretty much exclusive arrangements? Your clients don't work with other link building firms. I'd say it's a probably it's about 50 50. And a lot of times they don't even tell us, which I like to know if somebody else is doing something. And I think they should know. But a lot of people just don't really care about that. Some have their own internal team and we kind of function like as a supplemental agency to that. And then there are some where we're the only people doing anything. So sometimes we do know I've got a client where we're, we're trying to get a very broad link profile. So we're doing stuff. There are people doing guest posting. There's some people doing like resource links, PR, things like that. And I think that is working very well because it all kind of complements each other and makes the link profile look very, very natural to me. We don't get that luxury with a lot of clients. They may not have the budget to hire different link teams. Got it. Okay. So how do you get most of your clients? Is it through speaking engagements? Is it through referrals? 
typically it's one or the other for most SEOs, referrals, or or speaking, at least the folks that I know. Of course, I know a lot of people in the speaking circuit because I do a lot of speaking, but how about for you? For me, it's actually from search engine land, which I am incredibly thankful for. So every time I have an article published, I tend to get 10 to 15 different potential clients reaching out. So that has truly been amazing for me. I think, you know, they're definitely the biggest way I get referrals, but also just referrals from other SEOs. We get referrals from clients and things like that. We, I don't think I've ever gotten more than, I think I've gotten one client from maybe four speaking engagements and that was it. So that never really was, yeah, not my way of getting work. But a lot of it too, with because link buying is kind of risky, we get a lot of word of mouth referrals too. Got it. This I think will be interesting to you. I learned from Bob Allen, who's also been on this podcast, that you're either a writer who speaks or a speaker who writes. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. I am a speaker who writes. I personally hate writing, (laughs) although I'm (laughs) prolific with it, and I'm co-author of The Art of SEO, which is like a thousand-page tome. Right. I didn't write it all by myself. I had co-authors, and we also had ghostwriters and editors helping us, too. But it's painful. It's like pulling teeth to get me to write an article for Search Engine Line, which I do every two months. I could do it more often, but I don't want to. On the other hand, speaking, I just, I'm in my element. I love being on stage. I just, I get into presentation mode and it just flows. It's like magic. And then I can get that recording of my speech and have somebody transcribe that, have somebody else draft a blog post based on it, and then I just review it and tweak it, and that's so much easier for me. So right. I'm a speaker who writes. That was a big aha for me to learn that that's how I work versus just thinking, not even having that distinction beforehand. So what are your thoughts about that? I think I'm the opposite, definitely, a writer who speaks. One of my degrees was in English, and when I got drafted onto an SEO team after being on a programming team, it was because of my English degree, because they needed somebody that could write. And I mean, the painful thing with me for writing is just coming up with something I haven't said a billion times or that hasn't been said, especially with link building. You know, a lot of it really doesn't change that much. But writing is definitely something that I enjoy. And I've done technical writing before, and I just love all of it. And I don't mind speaking. It doesn't make me nervous or anything like that. It's just, I think I write better than I speak, definitely. And looking, you know, I read better than I hear also. So for me, I think I can get my point across much better when I'm writing than if I'm speaking. Yeah, I read better than I hear too. Right. I do enjoy listening to audiobooks, but my yes. retention is not as good Right. versus me reading it. Yeah, same here. Yeah, like in university, I would skip all the lectures and just read the book, the, the <laughs> textbook. That's and exactly I would, what I did too. <laughs> I they saw the exams and right. I didn't waste my time sitting in these lecture halls. That was great. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. So what's been your your biggest lesson from building this agency up and kind of figuring everything out, what works, what doesn't work in terms of the Google algorithm, in terms of starting a business and running it and growing it and then scaling it back a bit? What's your biggest lesson you want to share with our listeners? I think definitely don't put your eggs all in one basket, which is such a cliche, but it's very true because when we first started, we had one big client and then we got other big clients and we kept staffing up. And I was constantly in a state of panic thinking, one of these guys leaves, we're going to have to lay off 10 people. And it didn't happen for a while, but when it happened, we had to lay off about 20 people. And I have never wanted to be in that position again. I I don't want to have to borrow money for the business, work 70, 80 hours a week. I just don't want to ever be very dependent on one source for my business. And currently we're not, which is good. But I just really don't like that feeling that I could potentially cause people that I really care about to lose their jobs because I haven't tried to make this a more diverse group of clients. Yep, I can totally relate. Back when I had my previous agency, Net Concepts, we got seven-figure contract uh, from Zappos, and it was mm-hmm. amazing. We hired all these people, and we were just crushing it for for Zappos, like just doing amazing work for them. We had we figured we'd have them for years, right? And then out of the blue, they canceled. They were using oh. our software as a service that I had invented that allowed us to do proxy-based SEO. 
We could optimize their website without having access to their back end. Oh, wow. It was amazing. And we were charging on a cost per click basis. Mm -hmm. It was good times. And like I said, it (laughs) added up to seven figures in performance-based revenue. We were killing it for them. And then somebody in the company said, wait a second, who is this Net Concepts? Why are we spending so much money? And they decided that they'd pull the plug on that and try and build something in-house. Oh, it's brutal. It is brutal. We had to do layoffs and everything. Oh, Oh, I hate that. Painful. Uh, uh, Yeah. That was the only time that we had to do layoffs and Mm -hmm. don't ever want to do that again. No, me neither. Yeah. All right. Well, this has been a fabulous interview. I've really enjoyed it. And I'm sure our listeners have as well. How can they get in touch with you if they wanted to work with you? Usually you can get me at julie at linkfishmedia.com. But I've been using my personal Gmail account for work for ages and ages since I was doing freelance. And that's julie.joyce at gmail.com. Awesome. And then your website, linkfishmedia.com, is a way they could learn more about your agency. Yes, absolutely. And they can contact me through that, too. Awesome. Well, thank you, Julie. Thank Thank you, you, listeners. We will catch you guys on the next episode of Marketing Speak. In the meantime, have a fantastic week. Thanks for listening to the Marketing Speak podcast. Your host has been Stefan Spencer, three-time author and leading expert on SEO and online marketing, whose client list boasts such brands as Zappos, Sony, and Chanel. Want to learn more about SEO, social media, or just generally how to build an online empire? Visit marketingspeak.com for an archive of past episodes, along with transcripts and show notes. In addition, a wealth of resources that include video-based training, screencasts, webinars, white papers, articles, and blog posts can be found on his SEO coaching site, scienceofseo.com. To reach Stefan, visit his personal website at stephanspencer.com or email him directly at stefan at stephanspencer.com. Until next time.